Welcome to the ninth annual Autumn and Adams Week. This year's theme, The American Dream, Yours, Mine, and Ours, continues tonight with a Civil Rights Roundtable discussion led by Dr. Ed Crowther. Tomorrow we have events regarding issues in immigration, and Saturday is the annual cook-off. Um, for more information, visit autumn.adams.edu. Colorado is a swing state, so as you all know, we're getting a lot of campaign ads, radio, TV, newspapers. So this presentation by Dr. Mark Finney, PhD and Associate Professor of Mass Communication, and Dr. Rob Dembski, Department of Psychology, will combine the mass communications and political psychology perspectives in deciphering political campaign ads. <laughs> oh, is it here now? Yeah, why don't you get set up? Let's let's stop when we get to the ads. Go ahead. Um, well, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your interest here. Um, it's it's always valuable to to faculty when we present something and people actually come. So it's uh, really great to see all of you here. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Finney and I like to do with our courses is we like to find out who's in our audience. And we're, we're also self-revealing as well, so anything I ask you, we're going to ask ourselves. So the first question to sort of get to know you is, uh, how many of you, with a show of hands, might say that you're strongly interested in politics? Maybe it's like about three quarters of you. Okay, very good. That was an easy question. The second question might be a little bit harder, uh, a little bit more revealing. The second question is, uh, how do you identify uh, as a liberal, independent, or conservative? And, and I'll leave it to you to sort of self-define what those labels mean. So let's start with liberal. Okay. Are you raising your hand? And I'm raising my hand too. I would I would classify myself in that way. And also I'm very strongly interested in politics. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, independent. Okay, a couple of you. And then conservative. Okay, all right, thank you very much. And then um, the third question is how many of you are registered to vote? Fantastic. Cool. Okay. Um, so one of the things that, um, well I guess the purpose of this lecture today is to talk about political ads and to dissect what political ads are all about, what they're trying to do in ads. And I wanted to sort of start off with this quotation because in a lot of ways the kinds of things that we see in political, political ads mirror the kinds of things that we see in product advertisements. And uh, Thomas Hollihan is a an author that we use in, uh, in, in our 2012 election class, which we're teaching this semester. Um, and this quote I thought was really very interesting, especially the last part of it here. At least with soaps and lotions, we usually get what we pay for. And we have the opportunity to pay a little bit less for a generic brand. Mm -hmm. Are you raising And we have the opportunity to return it if we don't like it. <laughs> 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 Thank you. But that creates a fundamental difference between political ads and product ads, even though in a lot of ways they're marketed towards us in the same kinds of ways. Um, so what we wanted to do today is just to talk about some of the ways that political ads look and why they look that way, and to have you all help us decipher some of the ads from the historical, um, from the 80s and the 90s, no, all from the 80s, and then also to look at some of the ads from this campaign and try to dissect what they're really trying to do with us. Yeah, thinking about the quote that you just saw, Dr. Finney sort of proposed that there's a fundamental difference between uh, product ads and political ads. And I'm sort of curious to find out whether you agree with Dr. Finney or maybe don't agree or somewhere in the middle. Any, any reaction? Yes. Well, my first reaction is that um, rich people drive a Mercedes and middle class people drive Fords and Chevys and poor people take the bus and that's kind of uh, mirrored in, in the government that the different social classes take. 
Okay? Mm -hmm. Anybody else have some thoughts on this distinction between consumer ads and political ads? Are they really that much different uh, or are they similar in some way? Dove soap doesn't bash dial soap. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't, I mean, Coke and Pepsi Fruit find it out a bit, but. Lucky Charms. Right. They don't generally talk about how bad the other right. products are. Right. And that is a big part of the local ads. Okay. Money if you want. So if you're, you know, if you feel like they're the same on both sides, you know, like Dove and, and Dial, you know, if you just want to save some money and get go to Sands and get a bigger pack, you know, of something or quantity, uh -huh. then uh -huh. so what? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Anybody else any thoughts? Yes. You probably don't have the supporters of Dove buying ads to buy Dove ads. Right. <laughs> There's no Dove lovers super pack, right? <laughs> Do you, do you think there's a distinction in, say, the truthiness of consumer ads versus political ads? Are they equally true, equally not true, equally <laughs> confabulated? You can tell you define truth on the national news. Last night they were talking about products and this young boy, I think he was 10 or 11, had indicated products that say new and improved generally mean smaller size. Uh, the same price. So, it depends on how you Through advertising, you convince the public that there's a difference between Pepsi and Coke. You can convince them there's a difference between your candidate and the other candidate if you have enough money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at um, campaigns, and uh, campaign ads uh, are a big part of campaigns, there has been some research going back all the way to the 50s that essentially says that before the election rolls around in the fall, most people have made up their minds who they're going to vote for. And so the issue becomes, well, do we really need campaigns? Do we really need campaign ads, especially, uh, if so many people have made up their minds? And uh, typically, campaign ads do not do very well at changing people's minds or converting people from one side to the other. Fairly, I think it's a fairly well-established um, finding there. However, there is, uh, uh, there is a function to campaign uh, ads, and one of them is to reinforce and the other one is to activate. By reinforcement, what I mean, uh, most people have decided before the fall election, who they're going to vote for. But what ads do is they reinforce the choices that have already been made. They reinforce by providing arguments, by providing factual information, so that if somebody has already decided, they can feel more confident in the decision they've made. They can also take that information, obviously, and then talk with other people about what they know about their candidate. Uh, so, uh, campaign ads and campaigns in general uh, reinforce decisions that have already been made. But they also activate uh, ideas and emotional reactions for those few people who are undecided. And this is, I think, where the real uh, power of campaign ads and campaigns in general come from, is that very, very few people uh, who claim to be undecided in terms of who they're going to vote for. Um, it's this group that uh, ads seem to be most effective. Uh, there's some obstacles to converting votes, and one is neutralization. And all that simply means is, is that if, you're, if you pay attention to ads on both sides, there's arguments and there's counter-arguments and there's counter-counter-arguments and so on. And these, these arguments tend to sort of cancel each other out. Uh, and so it reduces, to some degree, the, the effectiveness of converting people from one side to the other. Uh, resistance. Audiences don't sit by passively, as you know, and uh, sort of soak in these ads. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we'll think about these ads, and, and especially if you're a partisan, uh, you'll have counter-arguments uh, to these ads. And so there's resistance in, in some audience members to the persuasiveness of these ads. And then, and then finally, and this was a big one, indifference. Uh, 
I don't know what you do when you watch TV, but oftentimes I'm involved in other things. You know, cooking something, doing some cleaning, maybe even grading papers or something like that. But uh, oftentimes audiences are distracted and are not paying that much attention. And so this is another challenge that campaign ads have for uh, trying to convert a voter from one side to the other. At the same time, though, advertisers know that you're not paying that much attention to advertisements. And they do their best to try to incorporate that knowledge into the ads that, that, um, that they create. In a couple of minutes, we'll talk about different pathways to persuade you. And one of the things that they do is, given that they know that you're not paying attention, or they think that you're not paying attention, they try to activate this persuasion through ways that will get to you, even though you might be indifferent, or even though you might be resistant, or even though you might be reading a book while the advertisement is going on. In uh, social psychology, uh, there are uh, a couple of models of, of persuasion. And probably one of the most dominant ones historically is the elaboration likelihood model. And this comes out of Petty and Cassiopo's work originally from Ohio State. Um, there are other competing models, but this one is, is useful, I think, in that it, it takes a persuasive message and it breaks it down into two component parts. And I think the elaboration likelihood model is useful for that reason. Uh, the parts uh, are factual information, uh, policy positions, um, information that you can think about in a logical reason kind of way. Does this candidate hold the position that I hold? Okay. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> facts and information uh, sometimes are included in campaign ads. And it's sort of a matter of degree. Uh, how much hard information is presented in an ad. Uh, the other sort of dimension of a campaign ad are, say, the visual or the auditory cues. What do you see in front of you? Uh, and how persuasive are the images? How persuasive are uh, the, uh, the music, if there's music in the ad? Uh, and so that's the... Uh, that's sort of the other dimension of a campaign ad. And obviously consumer ads can be analyzed in the same way too. But both, both routes to persuasion here uh, can be effective uh, with, with different kinds of people. Uh, sort of the traditional view is that if the audience is fairly distracted, if they're not that interested, then these peripheral route cues, the visual and auditory cues are going to be effective because it doesn't take a lot of cognitive effort uh, to digest those, those, uh, uh, that dimension of an ad. If you're interested in politics and if you're paying attention and if you want to think about these messages, then the facts and the information, the central route is, is going to be effective. Um, so this is, this is a useful way, I think, to sort of begin to analyze campaign ads because we have, in general, these two different dimensions uh, to uh, uh, political ads. <laughs> uh, when we talk about product advertisement, they generally are trying to persuade you in five different ways. We're trying to get you to believe five or different things about the ad, or about the product that they're trying to advertise to you. How they do that is another issue which we'll get to. But what they're trying to do is get you to develop knowledge about the product differentiate the product from one another, associate the product with quality, stimulate demand, and then promote technological developments or changes in the product. And we can see a real relationship between these goals of product advertisement and the goals of political advertisement. The question though is, what's missing from this list? Or do you guys see any things that are missing from this list that they're also trying to do in political advertisements? Or do you see any things here that you know, that really don't quite fit when you're talking about political ads or when you're thinking about political ads? That was a question. <laughs> yeah? Well, part of this is about branding, right? So to what extent are political ads just about electing that candidate and to what extent are they about just sort of increasing the value of the brand, Republican, Democrat, whatever, and sort of helping also uh, elect people down the ballot? So same name recognition, right? Mm -hmm. 
and association with that particular brand of stuff, even if it's not the candidate that's being discussed directly. So this idea of, of branding would imply <laughs> that, there's, that there's a fairly um, close similarity between the goals of consumer ads and the goals of uh, campaign ads? Yeah. Yes, sir. I think so, sometimes there are differences. If you look at uh, BP's recent ads, um, they're not trying to sell gas necessarily or differentiate themselves from Shell. They're trying to rehabilitate their reputation. reputation from earlier sins and or cause people to forget them uh, altogether. All so I think that would be a, a, a niche piece for some candidates or uh, products. Right. We would differentiate that from advertisement and call it public relations, but you're right, that's another function that we see in, adver in product advertisement or in company advertisements that we don't see quite as much with uh, political ads, because they are trying to really sell you. I, I haven't seen an ad where a politician has said, oh, I've done something horrible, <laughs> and now I'm going to try to correct it, um, sort of what BP. Uh, has done there. Yeah, you don't. Even with Obama, um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I can't bring an ad to mind where a politician does that. Mm -hmm. Can I share one? That sure. I saw? Go, go uh, for it. It showed Obama and it said, like in text on the photo, and it was like, you know things were bad before I got here. And uh, then, so. yeah, before I got yeah. here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I I think another thing that political advertising attempts to do is to say we're for the flag and motherhood uh, and uh, say that we agree with beliefs that you already have. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that in a product advertising. I don't know. A Coke is pretty red, white, and blue, right? Pepsi is red, white, and blue. But, I mean, you do see a lot of those. They, they tend to be more subtle in product advertisements. But in terms of their, you know, appealing to you, your desire to get a little wealthier, to have a, you know, a nuclear family, to, you know, they do make those kinds of appeals, although they maybe do it more subtly than they do in political ads. Yeah, I think, I think a big component of political ads, as you've mentioned, is sort of the use of symbols and the sort of the implicit activation of value positions and moral right. positions. Uh, that's really important in political ads. But as you, as you were saying that, I was just, uh, a memory of a shake and bake uh, commercial came up. So there's the mom in the kitchen and the daughter in the kitchen, not the son. The daughter in the kitchen and they're making, they're making uh, uh, fried uh, chicken. But what's the setting and what's the implication here? Here we got the mom and daughter in the kitchen be working together on something. And so this idea of this implicit valuing of family and families being together and doing things together. So there's sort of an implicit value symbol message there. Even like for truck commercials, like, you know, like uh, Ford or Dodge, like hardworking men, cutting trees or working, you know. Uh -huh. It's like that's the American dream. That you work hard and you get you know, you get this beautiful truck, so it's kind of like political ads are like, we know about family and hard work, so it kind of touches on the same things, but just in different ways. I think another point to make is that political parties don't necessarily disagree after someone like Elliot Spitzer comes out and, you know, he has to admit his mistake, he disappears, um, but the party doesn't necessarily disappear, just as the product of the Toyota Recall breaks doesn't disappear. So, mm -hmm. you know, individuals I think that segues us really nicely into our next. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. Use of frames. Okay. Um, in in thinking about how to analyze an ad, how to appreciate an ad, I think one of the useful concepts is this idea of frames. And when you when you think about all advertising, everything is very very deliberate in political ads and consumer ads, nothing uh, is left to chance. And so uh, I think it's fairly fair then 
to look very closely and very critically at, at ads. And one of the one of the useful ideas is this idea of, of a frame. And frames are uh, conceptual structures. In psychology, we call them schemas sometimes. And all that schemas or frames are are sets of uh, ideas, beliefs, values, images, memories, emotional reactions. And what we know about uh, the brain is, is that the brain sort of organizes itself into neural networks. And uh, these frames, then when we see them, they activate different kinds of neural networks. And when one neural network is activated, Oftentimes, that inhibits the activation of other neural networks. So, for example, um, if I asked you to think of family values, okay, that phrase has a lot of connotations. You have a lot of beliefs about what that phrase means. Uh, maybe you have some moral judgments. You might have some memories. You might have some imagery that might come to mind when you think of the term family values. And so in that sense, when family values are invoked, that's a frame. And there's a whole set of interlocking knowledge that potentially can become activated by hearing that phrase. Uh, another example, uh, the death tax. It's a very interesting way to label the estate tax, right? But when you, see, when you hear those two different phrases, they bring, they activate or bring to mind different ideas and different emotional reactions. And so we have this tax. And of course, part of politics is to persuade the citizen to think one way or another about that tax. And so uh, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives use different fra frames as a means of persuasion to activate some things in the audience memory and, and not uh, other things. Um, <clears throat> so when we were just talking a minute ago about the different images that you see in ads, the mom and daughter frying chicken, the lumberjack getting into his truck, the red, white, and blue colors of the Pepsi can, you know, those are all frames. They are all designed to create these ideas for you and to sustain these ideas while inhibiting these other ideas that might persuade you not to buy their products. And, and it's important to remember that frames are not just conceptual. You, just, you don't just pick them up in text. You can, frames can be activated by visual images. Frames can be activated by, by music and by sounds too. Uh, and to make things even more complicated, Frames reside within frames. So we've got this sort of hierarchy, these overarching, what's the overarching frame of a particular ad? Well, what are the subframes in that ad? And, you know, um, as uh, people that are high in need for cognition, uh, it's, it's very interesting to, uh, to look at these ads at these sort of multiple levels of frames. Uh, when you think of a narrative, when you think of a story, a story, in a sense, is a kind of frame. And there's some evidence that, that sort of supports this idea uh, for audiences, is when something is told in a story fashion, it's a lot easier to remember what the message of the story is. And so fables are a kind of narrative, right? Fables typically have uh, a moral message to them. And we may not remember the details of the fable, but we oftentimes remember the moral of the story, right? And so narratives are really important uh, as a means of persuasion. And when you think about it, if you see a, a consumer ad, oftentimes there's a story in the ad. So it's the guys driving through the woods with their brand new cars, and, and they're having all this fun going up the mountain, and they go through the, the mud and the creek, and they get their car all dirty, and then they get out, and they're having a great time. There's a narrative. Okay. And the narrative is, is meant to evoke a particular emotional reaction, but also a set of ideas and beliefs, too. Uh, but uh, oftentimes, you'll see in political ads that we also, the ad sort of creates a narrative. It creates a story. And oftentimes, there's a moral message. There's a value-laden message. 
Sometimes there are criticisms of the opponent and, and then uh, also uh, claiming accolades for the originator of the ad. So in narratives, we have characters, we have plots, uh, we have morals. And oftentimes in political ads, you'll see that kind of thing. Frames are important because they help us to understand uh, what the message is. Frames, the, the way an ad is framed poses, it defines what the problem is. Uh, how we frame something determines how we view the problem. How we view the problem determines oftentimes uh, what the causes of the problem are and what the solutions to the problem are. So frames provide a lot of information. A lot of the information is implicit. Uh, but the more we think about it, the more you'll become aware of how frames become really important. Uh, a guy by the name of Drew Weston wrote a really interesting book a while back. Uh, it was called The Political Mind. And he makes a, a really important proposal. And the idea here is, is that, in general, human beings are not as rational as we like to think we are. Uh, oftentimes, the decisions and the choices we make are based on some sort of emotional reaction. And that, uh, the logical reason or the justification for the judgment follows sort of post hoc or after the fact of the emotional reaction. We know from brain scans that when you present images to people uh, and you ask them to make a choice or make a judgment, uh, a lot goes on before we're, we really become conscious of our uh, perception, become before we become aware of what we're actually thinking. So the idea here is then that a lot of cognitive activity occurs at the unconscious level. And what we really become aware of is sort of the tip of the iceberg there. Uh, oftentimes, the emotional reaction will come first, uh, that sort of gut level response. And then the, the reason or the justification for the emotional reaction follows. Um, so, uh, what Weston is saying here then is a lot of our political choices are really at base emotionally driven. Now that sort of runs counter to this idea that in a democracy uh, we have citizens that gather information, that weigh pros and cons and make rational choices for the best of the nation. To some degree, this sort of calls into question that very, very basic assumption of democracy and the assumption of the age of enlightenment, the, the, um, the pinnacle of, of human thought going all the way back to Aristotle, rationality and reason and so on. And so this sort of calls into question. There are others that have called this, called this um, the, the, um, the prominence of reason into question too. Uh, um, Weston isn't the only one. Um, so, but anyway, this plays, emotions play an important part in analyzing political ads. And so it's important to understand what emotions do the ads desire to activate in the audience. And obviously the frames that are chosen uh, are chosen very consciously to evoke particular emotional reactions. Uh, another thing that ads do is they activate uh, moral systems and values, and I define values as emotion-laden generalized beliefs about what ought to be. So we have these generalized views about the world in terms of how we should interact with each other and sort of how uh, our lives should be, what should society look like in an ideal kind of way. And so in a sense, these are values, these are beliefs. Sometimes the values that we hold are really, really important to us and we're very, very aware of them. And those values can drive our choices. Uh, sometimes the values that we hold are implicit, meaning that we're not real aware of them all the time. They're not particularly salient. Um, but uh, the activation of values in the audience uh, is a very, very important strategy for uh, political campaign ads and maybe in consumer ads to some degree. 
Uh, values play an important role. They bind and they blind. And what, what I mean by that is uh, val moral systems have associated with them moral communities. Okay. And when you look at the political orientation, liberals, conservatives, in a sense, these are big moral communities where there are shared values. When you look at an ad and it activates a value in you that you strongly believe in, that ties you to other people. Maybe the campaign, maybe the uh, candidate, but a whole host of other people as well. You know, we, we live in communities, we need communities, and values bind people into communities. So that's sort of the positive side of values. The opposing side is that uh, when we create these in-groups for ourselves, what often happens is, well, now we have out-groups. Groups that we are not members of. Groups that we don't know very much about. But if, if we know something about them, oftentimes that knowledge comes in stereotypes about that group. The others who are not in our moral community. And when you look at values on the conservative versus the liberal side, in a sense, over time, we've sort of created these, these two communities that are sort of clashing with each other. Uh, and when we view human society as us versus them, we set the stage for clashing and we reduce the likelihood of compromise. Especially in politics where political positions, policy positions are tied to value and moral positions. Is anybody going to compromise their moral views to try to work out something with the opposing side? That's a tough question. But when we tie policy positions to values and we create this us versus them, then we have some real challenges for democracy. Um, a guy by the name of Jonathan Haidt uh, proposes that we have these six moral foundations. And it's sort of an interesting uh, uh, taxonomy here to look at. And uh, oftentimes, uh, I think Republicans are extremely good at tapping into every single one of these value positions. And so that creates a certain amount of power for Republicans and conservatives. Weston proposes, and I, th I sort of agree with him, that uh, liberals and Democrats are not very good at tapping into some of these uh, value positions. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we start looking at the ads. Uh, here's just another way to, um, uh, to view values. This comes from George Lakoff. And he proposes that we have this particular uh, uh, set of values for conservatives versus liberals. This is generalized. Uh, and in a sense, this is stereotypic, as I say. It's not to say that liberals don't believe in responsibility. Uh, they do. Uh, but there tends to be leaning one direction or the other on some of these values, whether you're liberal or conservative. So when we critique ads, we need to pay attention to all the things that are, tr that are happening to us on the screen at the same time. We want to pay attention to the text, which means that we look at the words that they're using, we, learn, we look at the phrases that they're using, we try to discern to the best degree possible what the values, what the emotions are that are built into the terms that they use, the choices that they make in terms of the texts. We also want to look at the images, which means the color scheme of the, of the video or the photographs, the way that the text and the images play together or sometimes don't play together to produce or to reinforce particular ideas. And then there are other aspects that we're trying to analyze as well, such as the music that they're playing, um, the way that the music changes, the way that the candidates' facial expressions to some extent uh, represent di different ideas to us as we're looking at the advertisements. You know, usually when I look at a, at a political ad or any kind of an ad to do an analysis, I'm going to look at it like five, six, seven times to try to really get a sense for what's actually going on in there, what kinds of persuasive appeals, appeals that they're trying to make for us. And then the last thing that we want to do is to evaluate the ad 
you know, um, Dr. Dembski has been talking about how we, um, how these ads have real political consequences in terms of our ability to understand each other, our ability to compromise or willingness to compromise. And so when we look at, a, at evaluation, we're really looking at what kinds of, you know, social or political effects can we expect from a totality of ads, certainly, but for can we expect from each ad, you know, on its own as well. So let's watch one. This is a classic sort of historical political ad, one that is known for being very pervasive, persuasive, very effective. It's uh, Ronald Reagan's ad from 1984 during his re-election bid. It's morning in America again. Oh, I don't. I should probably tune the sound up, huh? Um, yeah, I mean, folks have been sort of getting up and down. We, we're we kind of running behind schedule a little bit, so if you want to just get up while we're watching the ads, I think that'd be okay. I mean, it's... It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980, Nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. This afternoon, 6,500 young men and women will be married. And with inflation at less than half of what it was just four years ago, they can look forward with confidence to the future. This morning again in America, and under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger, and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? Should we run it a second time? I think we're going to run this a second time. Um, yeah. And so the question we're going to pose to you once this is done running is, knowing what you know now about campaign ads, uh, what stands out to you in terms of your analysis of the ads? It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980, nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. This afternoon, 6,500 young men and women will be married. And with inflation at less than half of what it was just four years ago, they can look forward with confidence to the future. This morning again in America, and under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? So, what do you think about President Reagan's uh, ad for re-election? Likes white people. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay, so right off, and, and you know, I'm not sure that we would have noticed that as much in 1984, but today we're saying lots and lots of white people. There may have been one not white person. I thought I saw an African American guy getting into a, uh, into a, a, a wagon at one point, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. Okay, so marriage equality is not an issue in 1984 either, right? <laughs> yeah. But I think it's funny because he's like giving all these kind of like facts, like inflation and all that, but you really aren't really paying attention to that because of like the, the seat that's happening in front of you, like this just this nice, happy life, and then he's like talking about inflation, so you're kind of like not getting the real message. So there's sort of some incongruity between the facts that he's asserting on the screen, or on, in the text rather, and the images that are being portrayed. And the images are all very, you know, positive, happy, families playing, working even, yeah. Right. 
Right, so even though we didn't see President Reagan, right? I mean, he only came on at the very end in the screen, but you know, we get the impression of him both as a good guy and also as a leader, because people are looking up to him. And at the same time, we're also associating him with the United States because the flag represents kind of, you know, the United States for us. So while they're mentioning President Reagan, we're seeing people looking up to him as a leader, and he's sort of the embodiment of the flag of the country. Sort of like what we were talking about earlier, there was no product differentiation in the ad. So he wasn't talking about the opponents at all, he was just talking about what he did. And there was also no room for innovation or anything like that. What do you mean? Just, um, they sort of didn't know how they're going to use technology and innovation to make their products better. Whereas he only used his past history to show what he had already done. Right. He wasn't saying what he was going to do. Just really was just naming facts that happened over the past, past four years. Right. And why do you suppose that he did that? Why is it that President Reagan really focused on the last four years in this ad as opposed to looking forward? Mm -hmm. At the very least, he wants to reinforce that idea that things have been really good in the last four years, and if you elect me, they will continue to be that way. Yeah, right? kind of add on to that. Um, he's making the assumption of, um, you know, if it's not broken, then why try to fix it? So. Yeah. What do, what do you think the desired emotion activation was by the folks that put this ad together? What emotion does the ad want to evoke? Nostalgia. Fright? Pride. Pride. Oh, okay. Who said, somebody said nostalgia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other thoughts? Patriotism. Patriotism? Patriotism. <coughs> Contentment. Pardon me? Being content. Oh, uh -huh. being content. Okay. Yeah. Complacency. Compla complacency? The complacency? Yeah, things the way they are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The way they are. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wondered hope. Yeah, man. Did you see, what, what's the dominant frame, the, o, the most overarching frame uh, in this ad? Good morning. Happy morning. Good. Yeah. yeah. When we think of the morning, what does the morning mean? We've got all this in front of us. We've got hope for a good day. Things are going to work themselves out. Yeah. Morning. The over, I think the overarching frame is that. Very, very positive idea there. So the next ad we'll watch is a very different one. This is from 1988. It's an ad for, well, President Bush uh, against his opponent, uh, Dukakis. As Governor Michael Dukakis vetoed mandatory sentences for drug dealers, he vetoed the death penalty. His revolving door prison policy gave weekend furloughs to first-degree murderers not eligible for parole. While out, men committed other crimes like kidnapping and rape, and many are still at large. Now Michael Dukakis says he wants to do for America what he's done for Massachusetts. America can't afford that risk. We'll just watch that again. As Governor Michael Dukakis vetoed mandatory sentences for drug dealers, he vetoed the death penalty. His revolving door prison policy gave weekend murderers to first degree murderers not eligible for parole. While out, many committed other crimes like kidnapping and rape, and many are still at large. Now Michael Dukakis says he wants to do for America what he's done for Massachusetts. America can't afford that risk. This is part of the little documentary, so we won't watch the rest of it, but. So, what are your impressions of this ad? There's all the non-white people. Fear, right? Sorry? So, it's supposed to create fear. There's a real racial component to it as well, right? And somebody in the, in the back uh, raised your hand. I couldn't hear what you said. With the oh, she said fear. Oh, fear, and then somebody else was talking at the same time. Well, I, think, I think it's supposed to instill fear and then make us angry at the person who did this, and even disgust, a moral sentiment of this person who would risk us, put us at risk. Yeah. Well, I 
because like you're kind of just supposed to believe what this guy's saying. Like now in ads, like whenever they say something that's like citing or you mm -hmm. know like going up a stagger of the year, this guy's just like this is what's happening. You better believe it. And this is what we want for you know America. Um, absolutely. Um, this is an ad that really works on the visual elements of the advertisement. Were there visual, what visual things did you notice when you watched this? Black, black, and white. black and white. What does that do for you? Depressing. Yeah. It's depressing, okay. So it also represents the racial component as well. Oh, and also the moral component. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thinking about the implicit value message here, uh, I sort of take away this idea of protection. We need to protect ourselves, right? We need to protect the citizens. We need to protect our families uh, against harm. So that's sort of the implicit value message. And then obviously the revolving door is a very good metaphor. Uh, in a sense, that's a frame right there. When we think of a revolving door, people are going in, you're going out, you're going in, you're going out. Uh, and this can be dangerous, applied to this. Did you have something to say? Well, I would say it seems that, it, that this sentiment that great deception is pretty much there fine with it. Mm -hmm. You know, morning in America, I don't think there was anything that was factually that incorrect. It wasn't a very factually <laughs> oriented ad. Well, right, but, it, but this revolving door, right. it's, wow, it's a lot. <laughs> It, folk, it takes more of a peripheral route to persuasion than a central route. Well, at least in more in America, there's like numbers, you know, twice the uh, interest rate is half the way. Right. Throwing out a few numbers where this was, many of them, yeah. Yeah, are still at large, many of them. Really right. Easy, you know, like many, how many? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One or two. <laughs> What would have made it backfire? I'm not sure I understand the meaning. Well, it gives a negative um, feeling. And when you're talking about, oh, too many people are being let loose, and oh, there's all these scenes of, in a prison setting, <coughs> behind bars, don't you think that that would well, what they were trying to do was to associate all of those feelings that you're talking about with the opponent, with Dukakis. Uh, Dukakis did this, Dukakis did that, and that led to this setting. That's the opposite of visual uh, stimuli. Well, because what they're, it's not the opposite actually, it plays right into it, because what they want you to do visually is to feel that trap, feel that fear when you think about Dukakis. Does it make, no? Well, let's watch a modern one which sort of tries to do the same thing. Um, this is a Romney ad. What does it say about a president's character when his campaign tries to use the tragedy of a woman's death for political gain? What does it say about a president's character when he had his campaign raise money for the ad then stood by as his top aides were caught lying about it? Doesn't America deserve better than a president who will say or do anything to stay in power? I met Romney and I approved this message. What does it say about a president's character when his campaign tries to use the tragedy of a woman's death for political gain? What does it say about a president's character when he had his campaign raise money for the ad, then stood by as his top aides were caught lying about it? Doesn't America deserve better than a president who will say or do anything to stay in power? I met Romney and I approved this message. So this ad really similarly tries to associate this negative feeling with President Obama so that by corollary or by contrast you'll feel really good about Mitt Romney, right? Um, the dominant frame here I take away is the issue of character. Right. This president does not have character. 
And even when you look at the last image, he's walking down the hallways, sort of slumped over like he's sort of ashamed of himself. Mm -hmm. um, so if the issue is defined as a lack of character, well, what's the solution? Get rid of the guy. Um, now, you could do this with any political ad. Um, but I didn't know what the heck this ad was about. Um, it was, uh, yeah, when I watched it for the first time, I, you know, I couldn't figure out what they were talking about with the political ad. And it stems from an ad that never actually played um, in which an Obama-supporting PAC was trying to argue that um, this guy who was laid off by Bain Capital after they bought his company, that his wife died of cancer because he lost his health care, right? Now, the ad never ran, um, the ad that claimed that. And it wasn't associated with Obama. But what we see here is a lot of assertions about, the Obama, about Obama and about his campaign that are based on the presumption that this, uh, this advertisement was related to the Obama campaign. And like I said, you can do this with any campaign. But because I started looking at it, I started looking at it in a lot more depth, and I sort of learned some things about this ad. Um, so first of all, the reference advertisement was not an Obama ad. It wasn't produced by his campaign. It was produced by a PAC that supports Obama, but as you guys know from Citizens United, the campaign and the PACs are supposed to be not connected in any way, right? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and furthermore, the ad had never been run on television so as he asserted that Obama was doing all of this stuff by running the ad, that's, that's sort of disingenuous, right? It's, it's sort of completely disingenuous. Look, that ad actually forced people to go to YouTube where you can see it anytime. Right, it does exist on YouTube, and you could see it anytime. So that ad was designed to get them to go to YouTube. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, I have to think a little bit. In the beginning of your presentation, we were talking about to comparing advertising of consumer products to advertising of candidates. Uh -huh. But in for consumer products, isn't there a truth in advertising kind of law? Right. I mean, you can't make claims for a product that you cannot do. Right. But has any, I mean, this again is an outright lie. I mean, the, the so, Obama campaign never officially made this ad. It's so, right. I mean, I um, could just write it in the newspaper that. Mark Finney was never convicted of those crimes that were meant I mean, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> I mean it is it's stuff. a good point, Stu. And the thing is that, you know, the First Amendment and the Supreme Court have reaffirmed repeatedly that political speech is afforded a great deal of protection. And so you can say a lot of things in political speech that you could never see say in consumer speech. If, you know, these kinds of allegations in consumer speech might end you in a lawsuit. But, or end up in a lawsuit. But because it's political speech, it's afforded a lot more protection. So in a political campaign, the only recourse would be for one candidate to actually sue the other for libel. No, no. The only recourse would be for the other campaign to counter that information with their own information. Right? Obama, I mean, could sue the Romney campaign over this, but it's not likely. But the other thing is that, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you know, the quotes that they used in this ad were taken out of context largely. Um, when they put disgusting up here, the implication was that Obama was being disgusting in doing this ad. But it was in fact, the referenced article, the ABC News from August 9th, actually was talking about a political strategist who's saying that the guy who created this ad is sort of disgusting and ought to go back to advertising school, right? <laughs> when they said Obama campaign admits knowing the referenced article says that he knew the story behind the guy. Not that the ad was disingenuous or that the ad was false, but that Obama knew the backstory of the guy in the ad that this ad references, right? Um, when it says unfair attack, and all of these are implying that Obama is doing this stuff and that news articles are calling him out on it, right? Well, the unfair attack quote comes from an editorial, not from a news article. And editorials are fundamentally different than news articles. They're one author's opinion as opposed to a news organization's perspective on what's happening. It's really important when you look at these things that you don't just say, oh, CBS News, if they believe it, it must be true, right? Or if they printed it, it must be true. Because in all of these cases, and each one of these ads, I mean, I only showed you three or four of them, the, they were truly taken out of context, um, they, or they were truly stretched as far as they could in order to make it look like 
these news organizations were calling Obama out, when in fact they weren't calling Obama out. None of them, in my view, as I read them, were actually calling Obama out. Uh, the effectiveness of this ad will probably be most strong with somebody who hasn't decided to vote yet, doesn't know who they're going to vote for yet. For partisans, uh, uh, this is probably not very powerful because uh, there can be counter arguments uh, uh, from the opposing side. But for people who haven't decided yet, this could be powerful depending on how much knowledge they have about the claims uh, in the ad. And the other thing about this is that these arguments are supported by the visual rhetoric that exists in the ad. Um, this picture of Obama on the top, what does that make you think of, given the context of the ad that we just watched? That he looks shifty, right? That he's looking over his shoulder Oh, crap, they might catch me doing what and I'm not supposed to be doing, right? And then the one below I thought was really telling because it looks like he's like, yeah, I'm getting away with this shit and nobody's going to get in my way, right? So the visual rhetoric really backs up the, the textual arguments that were being made. I think, can we, we have time yeah, for one, one more, more, right? Ad, I think. Okay. Yeah. So this is an Obama can ad. Just put one thing in here? Sure. With the uh, attack in Libya and the death of the ambassador. Uh huh. Romney came out and slammed Obama for his right. foreign policy. Yeah. He's turning it into a political statement. Well, yeah, that's a whole separate issue. Yeah. But yeah, that was pretty interesting. So he's basically doing the same thing he was accusing Obama of in that ad. Um, our students really enjoyed this upcoming ad. <laughs> I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. Oh, beautiful, four spacious skies, forever waves of rain, or purple mountains, majesty above the fruit and plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with bright. One more time. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. Oh, beautiful, four spacious skies, forever waves of rain, or purple mountains, majesty above the fruit and plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown. So, what'd you see here? <laughs> Mazel's <laughs> shaking his head. Well, my first thought was that, you know, it's one thing for a person to be evil, but what we really hate is somebody who's just annoying. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> so his singing is annoying, you mean? His singing. I mean, it starts with the singing, right? It's just right. annoying, and of course we're associating with him. There is a real dual meaning in the singing, the way that it's presented here. What is that? He's off key. Have there you ever heard? There's the echo, the hollowness. What, what does it mean, though, to be out of touch or out of tune, right? He has, he, he's tone deaf. He's tone deaf to what's going on by representing him. And this is him singing. It's not like he made the, you know, Obama made the supper, auto-tuned it or anything. But he's talking about how out of touch or how tone deaf Romney is supposed to be by having him sing over this. And then... Yeah. And also, I, I take away a bit of hypocrisy here as, as sort of a dominant frame. Here's somebody who's patriotic singing the national anthem, but yet look what he's uh, allegedly doing to the country. So hypocrisy. Um, there are some other visual elements that I want to mention since we're running out of time. You know, the screen here where he's starting to sing, it's sort of lined like an old-fashioned TV. And that is also designed to create a sense that Romney is old-fashioned, right? That he's not modern. He's not in HD. He's lined and cracked, just like your grandpa's TV, right? And of course, uh, these are some fairly obvious visual and, and musical elements. He's singing about America, but at the same time, we're talking about the plants that have been closed, and we're seeing those. And we, because of his relationship with Bain Capital, we're associating the closing of those plants with what Romney would do, you know as president. Um, 
Same thing with this other one up here. This one I thought was really great because as he's singing the words, America, America, we're seeing a Swiss flag. And that those coincide with, with each other at the exact same time. And that's totally deliberate. So he's singing about America, but you know he's got a bunch of money over in a Swiss bank account. And thinking in terms of values, where's Romney's loyalty at? Is, is his loyal, loyalty towards himself or towards the country, right? In terms of emotions, anger, disgust, right, are meant to be activated by this ad, right? And the, the visuals of this lower one as well work really, really well for us. It's very dark. Have you ever seen an image of Swiss that, or, or Switzerland who looked worse than this, right? <laughs> it looks like a very depressing, sad, creepy place, yeah? Old world place. Yeah. Um, well, I think we're out of time. Are we out of time? We had two more ads, but yeah, we're out. We're out of time. Thank y'all. Have Thank some pizza you very if you much have for coming. I hope that this sort of piques your interest in uh, political advertising, and also maybe gives you some tools to work with when you're watching uh, these campaigns.